Yeah. Um, thank you so much for having me to both the NHS and Mohammed specifically for kind of bringing me in. Um, always honored to speak to y'all in terms of y'all are doing very important work and anything that we can do to support that very important work has massive impact across uh, obviously, you know, your entire region, but in terms of like motivating other organizations to invest in open source and that idea of like openly sharing content and openly sharing code and collaborating as opposed to hiding things like that's a that's an amazing ethos that y'all put out there. Um, as far as who I am, my name is Tom Mock. Um, I'm a customer enablement lead at our studio. Um, prior to that, I did a PhD in neurobiology back here uh, in home in Texas. Um, but decided that data science and kind of an education future was uh, more exciting to me than staying in a wet lab and working with mice and, and chemicals. Um, I'm very passionate about R and the entire uh, R community, um, and especially for like the open source ethos. Um, some projects that I work on are a personal blog. You can read at the mockup.blog, um, as well as the Tidy Tuesday project which is a weekly data science learning task, uh, essentially like scaled education as best as we can do it. Um, today, I'm gonna be talking about our markdown, uh, specifically kind of a, a deep dive into like the anatomy of our markdown, how our markdown works, some ways that you can use it in your organization and uh, kind of just learn a bit more about it. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. I know we're recording, so we can go ahead and get started, but let's share my whole desktop. And um, if someone can just confirm, I think Hansel, if you can confirm, you can see my screen okay? Yeah, it looks great. Perfect, great. Uh, the slides are gonna be available. I'll put them in the chat very quickly. Um, so that's a link to the slides directly. That's a public link. So you know, six months from now, that'll still be the link if you wanted to find it. There's also a RStudio Cloud project and I posted that in the chat as well. Um, that is more of the kind of workshop materials that you can play around with, some code examples um, that you can also interact with that have some, some details. And I also wanted to give a shout out to Hansel specifically. It looks like uh, they had given a, a specific uh, R Markdown intro. So there's some additional material that they put together here. Um, so I can put that in the chat and a lot of good resources that y'all are making available even internally, which is very exciting. The very last link, uh, which is also linked to in the slides, is the uh, source material for the presentation and the workshop. Again, a fully public link here so you can access everything. Uh, even if you, you know, you could basically recreate the RStudio cloud environment locally if you wanted to go that route. So jumping into the presentation, um, again, the slides are linked here and I put that in the chat. Um, but in short, we're talking about reproducible reporting. Um, you may have heard things like the reproducibility crisis or had some frustration when you're trying to put together a document uh, or a report and writing up everything, creating some beautiful graphics, you know, getting all your statistics and your numbers, and then having to copy paste it around and just having this workflow that can feel very jumbled and chaotic. Um, our markdown kind of seeks to solve that problem in terms of making things a bit more straightforward, a bit more linear, and really working with code first uh, and making things a lot more reproducible. So we'll be talking a bit about that as well as the overall anatomy of everything. Again, within this presentation, each slide will have a link to the slides themselves. And then you can find all the workshop material on my public GitHub and the slides linked publicly on here. I also wanted to give a shout out to Dr. Allison Hill. Um, she put together some content for the CDC and R for Pharma which was also under this permissive license of CCBY, which is what my slides are released under. Um, so great content that we kind of adapted from her work at our studio. In terms of what our markdown is, you know, our markdown is many things. It can be an authoring framework for data science, which is what we're talking about today. It can be a document format in terms of rather than a .r file, it's a .rmd file. Um, it's specifically a, a package. So there's an R package named R Markdown. Um, it's a file format for making dynamic documents with R. It's a tool for integrating your text, your code, and your results all together. It's a computational document. All these things are true, and all these link to different ways of thinking about R Markdown. But the also one of the ways I like to think about R Markdown is that it's just magic in terms of it takes all these different things, your text, your code, your output, 
puts it into a nice little pile, cleans it up, sends it out, and now you have your beautiful report at the end. In reality, it's not really magic, it's a lot of other code behind the scenes. So you might hear the words Pandoc or Knitter or LaTeX or HTML. All these different pieces behind the scenes are being compiled together and generating a beautiful output with the input being that text and code that you're writing. So while it can feel like magic and, and honestly, it's fine to think about some of the things as just like they happen, um, you can control almost everything you'd want to inside our markdown. So in terms of why our markdown, we talked a little bit about reproducibility. Like obviously you want to have things where if you generate a report or you generate a document, you want it to be reproducible so that others can you know, recreate your results or that other people can trust your results. But our markdown is more than that in terms of its reusability. So if you generate a template, someone else from inside your organization can then reuse that you know, some of that code or that template to create their own report. So the work that you're doing is not just for you, but it's for everyone in your team or everyone in your organization or everyone in the world if you're sharing that code publicly. It's also extensible in terms of it's not just one thing. It's not just a document. It could be a dashboard or a presentation. Like this presentation today is our markdown. Like it's Sherengen. So I wrote this entire presentation in our markdown. So it's more than just one thing. And then lastly, it's lazy ability in terms of whenever you're writing with code, at some point, you're going to become much more efficient. So you are able to be lazy, but in a good way in terms of you are able to reuse, you are able to reproduce or extend the work that you're doing, and you actually become faster at it as opposed to manually building all the pieces and manually combining them together. So really, this is the idea of like changing your mental model about what a report or what a document looks like. If you've used Microsoft Word or LibreOffice or anything else like that, like a word processor, um, your source document is your output in terms of you write text in there, you copy paste images or tables or anything else, whatever you create, where you're writing is your output in terms of they, they're completely intermingled which is fine in terms of like, you can write great documents in Microsoft Office. Our markdown and things like that in terms of computational documents are slightly different in that your source generates an output. So it's a, it's a shift in your mental model in that your R markdown and a single R markdown can actually generate different outputs. So for example, I could have an R markdown document that generates a slide for a presentation or R markdown that generates a PDF document or a Word document, or a PowerPoint document, or HTML content like an entire web page. So your source can actually generate multiple outputs. And importantly, because you have source, you can actually check that into something like version control. So Git or GitHub or whatever y'all use for that. So you are able to get the code that generated all these outputs and you can very quickly regenerate the output with say new data or changing one component and getting a nice, beautiful output very quickly. So separating out this source from the actual output you're creating is useful in that now you can do more things and you can extend it in multiple ways. As far as our markdown documents, if we wanted to define it in kind of a few short sentences, our markdown documents are fully reproducible, use a productive notebook interface to weave together narrative text and code to produce elegantly formatted output. And you can use more than just R. You can use multiple languages like R, Python, SQL, or even other languages not mentioned here. And what this means in, in kind of more you know, human terms is no more copy pasting, no more manually rebuilding analyses from all the different components. You don't have to generate your plots here and your tables here and you know, this here and put them all together in one document. Your source thing, your source document in terms of our markdown can generate and produce all those different components in line. So hopefully this would lead to you know less dread or fear when you need to rerun an analysis or the data is updated. With most of our markdown documents, the data could update and you could just re-render the document and it will regenerate all the plots and tables and all the other statistics or anything you ran in line in that same document. Now, while we've obviously got a lot of stuff to cover here in terms of we're going to break up our, our markdown document into its component parts and look at the anatomy and how everything works together, you can just go and use our markdown. 
you know, you don't need much guidance to just get started with it. Just like this, you know, digital camera, although most of us are probably using like an Android phone or an iPhone at this point. Um, the digital camera, you can just go pick up and use it. You don't need to understand how the optical lens works with the motherboard and the processor connects to the power source and all these different components. You can just use it. So our markdown is easy to use, just like this camera is easy to use, but we're going to cover the full details so you can go even further and understand all the different components of our markdown. Putting this in another way, uh, I, I recently learned that a lot of milk containers are actually boxes in, uh, in Europe. Uh, here we do a lot of milk cartons, but uh, I saw boxed milk uh, other places. So a straightforward task might be pour the boxed milk into the glass. So this is easy to use. You know, you can just pick up you know, a, a gallon of milk and pour it into a glass. Sure, that's great. What you might notice is that this milk is spilling a bit and it's kind of coming out intermittently. So while you can use it very easily, the correct way to use it when you understand the full details is making sure the cap is at the very top. So this allows air to always enter into the container and it will smoothly pour out and you won't get splashed milk. I thought this was kind of a, a great example in terms of like, yeah, you know, there is no wrong way to pour milk from a milk carton, but understanding the full details can allow you to do things a bit more smoothly or avoid running into errors or pain when you're trying to pour your milk, or in this case, write our markdown documents throughout the world. As I mentioned before, our markdown is not just one thing, it's many things. So yeah, it's a notebook. You can generate basic HTML, PDF, Word, open text, rich text, markdown. You can create full presentations, whether they're HTML or LaTeX or PowerPoint. You can write journal articles. If you wanted to submit something to many different journals, they have their own format. You can create dashboards, entire books, entire websites, personal blogs, documentation about our packages. Just it's slightly overwhelming in a good way, the things you can create. But again, you don't have to use all of these, just use the parts that are important to you. Maybe you never need to write a book. That's fine, you don't have to write a book. But everything you learn from the most basic R Markdown notebook can then be repurposed into all these other formats. So basically learning it once allows you to extend that knowledge in all the different ways. As far as our markdown itself and breaking up the anatomy, again, we're going to separate out a relatively simple document in terms of I can go to an R markdown document, and this is running in RStudio Cloud. So this is the documents that you have available. And I can just take the document and I can render it or I can knit it and create the output. You know, I don't have to know how everything works exactly from a technical perspective. I can just write the different components and things I know today and render those out. And I get this beautiful output just from rendering a document that has, you know, hyperlinks and the ability to expand portions and it's got graphics that are wide. It's got summaries from these R tables we've created, um, all this amazing power that you're doing. And while you might use all this, or you might use only a component of it, again, you have the ability to learn just the pieces you need and then expand that knowledge over time. So going back to the anatomy, now rather than thinking about you know, just the easy to use component, we're going to break down it into its component parts or into the anatomy of what an R Markdown document looks like. So R Markdown is made up of several things. The metadata, or what we call the YAML header. This is indicated with three dashes, and then at a minimum, the output of what kind of document you're creating. So in this case, I'm creating an HTML document, which is the default. Then you'll include some inline code. So you'll have these code chunks that are indicated with three backticks, brackets, a specific engine. So in this case, R, uh, a name for that, and then some different components about what you want the, the chunk to do. And then have some friendly tidyverse code or whatever code you're writing in line in these code chunks. And then you'll also intermix some text because again, this is a computational document. So you can write as much text as you want. And many documents are actually vastly more text than they are code. Specifically, the text is written with what is called markdown, which is a way of indicating what you want. So in this case, I can say, I want a large header or a heading one with a single pound sign. And then I can have a sentence with some bold text, some italic text and an image, 
all indicated in Markdown that get transformed into the formatted text in the future. We're going to go into each of those different components and we'll start with the metadata. So for the YAML, the YAML header is basically all the different stages that are processed in rendering and they basically influence what the final document looks like. So you're going to place it at the very top. It's usually the very first thing you write and it's read by all those different magical components behind the scenes that change what the document looks like. A generic YAML follows this pattern, three dashes and then key and value pairs, where you need to have this uh, you know, colon here to indicate the key, basically the name of the thing you're changing, and then the value of that thing you're changing. You do have to surround it with these three back ticks. When you create a blank R Markdown document, it gives you a minimal YAML header, but you can also write it by hand if you wanted to. Again, these are specific components or specific metadata about what the document and the rendering op options will be. If you want to look at what those are for your specific format, you can actually you know, look at them in R. So you can do like question mark, R markdown, HTML document. I want to know what are the different things I can change about an HTML document or a PDF document or a Word document. You can look at all the different options there, or you can go to the R markdown homepage linked on this slide and it will show you, here's all the different things you can change as well as what they mean. And again, you may only ever use a handful of these, but all of this power is here for you to set defaults or change what your document looks like whenever you wanna go down that route. So again, the default here, you're gonna start a document and it'll have three back ticks, or sorry, uh, three dashes. It'll have the output and say HTML document. But importantly, it's more than just that. It could be uh, HTML, it could be PDF, LaTeX, it could be an EPUB, a Word document. It's not just one thing. So by just changing out this HTML document to something else, you can actually generate an entire new document. So let's go a little bit step further. We have our YAML header. We're gonna title it, my first R Markdown report. I'm the author, and we want it to still be HTML document. I can change some of these different components by moving HTML document down a level, adding another colon, and then putting more changes to it. So I want a table of contents. I want to float the table of contents on the left. I want to change the theme, like the overall look of the document. And I want to make it where if someone's looking at the code, they can actually just download all the code from the document. So it basically embeds the code inside of it. But maybe I'm not interested in HTML. I want to create a PDF because I'm going to email it to my colleague or I wanted to have it be self-contained and open anywhere they want. So I can just change the output to PDF document and the whole rest of the document is fine. It's still ready to go. Or if I was making a presentation like I did today with this presentation, I could make the output Schrengen, which is a presentation format. It's kind of a play on words for like a ninja or an expert uh, ninja in this case. The Schrengen package, like many things with our markdown, is written by Yi Wei, who's an RStudio employee, uh, written a lot of different things that allow you to do computational documents in R and other languages. So we covered a little bit about the metadata. And while metadata is important, it may not be kind of like you're usually changing small components of it very specifically, as opposed to text is something that everyone is going to write and is very important for you to understand the different components. So for the text inside an R Markdown document, you have text as human language and you have Markdown as markup language. You might notice that in this one, you have italic text, bold human language, and we can recreate that in Markdown with this in terms of we have a asterisk indicating I wanna create a bullet point. We have some text that we're making uh, italicized by doing double backscores underneath it. And then two asterisk converts human language into bold text. And we do the same thing with the markdown here. So while this might look a little awkward initially, you know, you can quickly kind of get into this habit of learning a few different components and writing your text in this way. Or you could just write it however you want in terms of you could just write text and not have italics and bold and other things and just have the text in one long paragraph. That's more than fine. If you want to learn specifically about Markdown, there is an official Markdown guide, or the R Markdown cheat sheet has a lot of information about the different ways you can change Markdown and write it out. 
One of the other really importance about Markdown that'll be learning is changing different headers. And headers are like different components of your document. So in a document, you might have text that's like size 20. It's really big, it's bold, and that's indicating this is a section. Here's what we're going to be talking about in that section. And you do the same thing with Markdown and R Markdown by indicating different header levels. So you write pound sign, and however many pounds you do here, that will make it slightly smaller and indicate decreasing levels. You can see that even as you write it, it's moving a little bit to the right so that you have these little different sections. And these will basically create larger or smaller headers where fewer pound signs is a higher header level. So this will be very large text indicating this is a large uh, section, maybe you have a sub chapter and a subdivision of that chapter, and then just something important you want to note. Also inside our studio, these header levels allow you to navigate your document. So this screenshot here shows you that not only do I have header levels, but if I open up inside our studio, the outline view, or at the bottom, the chunk view, I can actually navigate to those portions. So again, if I move over to our studio in our studio cloud real quick, I can click on the outline button and it shows me all these different components. Because I've defined these header levels, I can say, I want to go to package setup, or I want to go to example data set. And I can navigate my document as I'm writing it. I can also go to very specific chunks. So these include the code chunks as well as the header levels here at the bottom. So by clicking down here, I can navigate from you know, the very head of it and the YAML header to the figure section to, I want to go to chunk six. And let's name this penguin layout. And now when I go back down, I have a name chunk. So I can actually navigate directly to that chunk if I wanted to. So again, while these aren't required, they allow you to navigate your document very easily so that you're not only do you get a nice rendered output, but even as you're working on the document as you go through, it's useful. Now, text can actually be more than just text. You can actually inline R code or programmatically generate specific components of the document i.e. like I can report that there are a specific number of rows in this data set by putting backtick R and then any valid R code, and it will return 32, saying there are 32 rows in empty cars. This inline text can be as complex or simple as you like, and you can also just return R objects. So maybe I want to write out an entire sentence and then return that. So now I have backtick R car rows, and it will return there are 32 rows in the empty cars data set. So by inlining code, you can imagine that there are times where you report like a p-value or a statistic, like how many patients or how fast the average patient was being seen or something like that. You can actually reference R code in your document and have those be automatically generated by the data. So rather than you manually having to write out sentences, you can have the numerical portions of sentences actually be output for you. And again, if we're going beyond just text, you know, obviously we can bold things, we can you know, make things italic, we can make header levels, we can also make numerical lists. So in this case, we have some text, you see that there's either a dash or a pound sign or a number. These will be converted in our markdown to bullet points or a numbered list. So again, vaccines are hugely important. We're right in the midst of you know, vaccines being one of the most important things in the entire world right now. And you can write about these things with our markdown and get your nice formatted list or numbered list as you want. Something else that I include a lot of is things like images. So the basic way of including an image in our markdown is with this syntax of exclamation point, bracket, some alternative text. So when you hover over it, it will tell you what does that image actually mean? And then a link to either a web image or a path to a local file. So you can include web images or files that are only on your computer. You could also do something like knitter include graphics, and that will allow you to, again, do the same thing, but you can control like how big it is, as opposed to this is just going to take the file and kind of try and squish it in there, which is fine. With knitter include, you can customize exactly how big you want the document or the image. So in this case, I'm shrinking down this hex logo for Sheringen. Now you might say like, oh, I, this seems a little bit overwhelming. I have to learn Markdown. In our studio, in our studio 1.4 and beyond, you can actually use what is called the visual editor mode. 
So in this case, rather than only seeing the unformatted uh, markdown, you can actually see what the final document is going to look like. So here, your headers actually turn into headers. Your tables are turned into header into tables, and you have hypertext and other things that you're writing in Markdown. So you can basically see the final document as you're writing it, which is very powerful. And it's more than just the ability to see the output. It actually has word processor style kind of syntax. So you can say highlight some text and make it bold or italic or change the header level or insert a table or format it in some way. So again, if I go to our studio and the RStudio Cloud environment y'all have access to, I can click on the visual markdown mode and this will convert it to what the rendered output will look like. So this header will show up as a header and the code chunks are still executable. So like I can still run code live if I wanted to, it will generate the output, but I get all of the formatting that I want to see. So I can look at the document as I'm writing it. I can say, well, I want this instead of being a header two, I want it to be a slightly smaller header three, or I can switch it back to being a header two. I want this to be bold. I can bold that or unbold that. And anything I change in the visual mode gets propagated back into the original markdown. So you can see, oh, this is how you do bold. You add two asterisks on either side. And you can flip back and forth instantaneously between those two different views. So very powerful as you're getting up to speed with our markdown, or just if you want to write more complex documents uh, in our markdown. So text is important. The YAML header is obviously very important. What many, many people spend a lot of time actually writing, though, is code. And that's the really important part of our markdown as well. So code chunks are basically specific sections that are you know, used to evaluate code and either return the output or just generate something behind the scenes. The basic formatting will be, again, three backticks, bracket or curly brackets, a specific engine in terms of I want to evaluate anything within these uh, fences as R code, and then you can change some parameters. So I don't want it to return the code, for example. I just want to see the output. So we'll take empty cars and say, how many distinct cylinders are there? And this will return back, you know, there's six cylinders, four cylinders, and eight cylinders in the empty cars data set. That's all the different um, cylinders that are available in that, in that data set. Now, if you want to insert a chunk, you can you know, either go in and say, you know, I want to insert a code chunk in terms of RStudio has a, a way to generate that. Or you can use something like a shortcut. So Control-Shift-I or Command-Shift-I in Mac will allow you to quickly insert an R chunk and then you can just evaluate that code one plus one and it'll give you the things you want. So as much as you want to memorize things, you can memorize them, or you can just insert the chunks as you want to do that. So that's fine as well. Now, as far as the anatomy of the code chunk, we've talked a little bit about the brackets and the engine and everything else. The basic idea is that you have to have three uh, back ticks on either side that basically creates the code chunk that's basically saying like everything inside here is code, evaluated as code. You want the engine. So we're, it's going to default to R, but you could change this to SQL or Python or Bash or whatever language you want to choose. You can have a label, and that label helps you, again, organize your document or reuse that component. And then you have options that are basically added beyond that label. And that's basically saying, again, key value pairs, the option equal to the value you want that option to be. So in this case, I want echo equals false, meaning don't return the code, just return the actual output. So I just want to see the output, not the code in this case. Anything you put in a code chunk will automatically print unless you save it to an object. So if I wanted to, again, get the number of distinct manufacturers in the GT cars data set, I could save that, but it's not going to print. It's just going to return that code unless I explicitly say, return the actual object I've created. So by saving the object, you can control when you want it to actually render out or show out the output. And you can do this in one chunk. So I could have the definition of an object and the returning of that object at, at the same time in the same chunk. But just showing you that if you want to, you can just generate the output or you can save the output and then generate it in line as well. 
Now, importantly, code chunks can do more than just you know print data. They can print graphics, and you might you know do some group by summarize to see you know, like what is the average uh, miles per gallon, and then you generate this plot. Now, on this presentation, you might be like, well, Tom, like what have you done? This this graphic is going off the page. I can't see the bottom. And we'll talk about that in terms of customizing the output to make sure it fits and looks exactly like you want it to. But just showing you that, yes, you can do things like return ggplots or return interactive graphics like Plotly or something else. You can also return things like tables. I'm a big fan of the GT package. And you can return you know, visual tables inside your document, whether it's a presentation, a Word document, HTML, or even a PDF. Now I mentioned these chunks are controllable or that maybe you create a graphic and it's too big or it's too small and you want to control all the different components. You can obviously go to all of the knitter options. And again, it's many different options that are used for very specific purposes. Or you can just kind of change the components you need. So maybe I want to write a piece of code, but I don't want to evaluate it. I'm just kind of printing out saying like, this is what we were going to do, but it's like pseudo code. So I don't want you to run it. So this won't actually do anything. It won't be evaluated because I've said eval equals false, but it will return, still return what the code was. So this is a good way of like writing fake code or adding different components that you're saying like, here's what we're thinking about doing, but we haven't done yet. Or for today, I'm talking about our markdown in our markdown. So I don't want to evaluate all the different chunks. I'm just showing some of them as we move along. Some of the things that are really common to change, um, although again, there's many different things you could change, is like, I want to change the dimensions of my figure. So I want it to be a width of four and a height of six, and that'll be in inches. Or I want it to be higher resolution. So I want it to have a higher DPI, and that'll make the plot a little bit higher quality in terms of more detail printed in it. Or I don't want to print the code, or I don't want to evaluate the code. Or it takes a long time for this one chunk to, to actually generate results because it's like running a model. I can cache that chunk in just that chunk to say, like, don't rerun this in the future, just store the results that I had from before. I can also do things like don't message or warn me if things happen. And include equals false basically hides everything about that chunk. So let's see what some of these chunk options do. So here's again an R chunk. We're using a basic empty cars data set and a basic graphic. But now we want it to be a little bit wider than it is tall. So six inches wide, four inches high, and have a DPI of 150. That will generate a wider than tall document and will increase the you know, quality of that document by increasing the dots per inch. However, you can also write these in line as of knitter 1.3.5. Sometimes maybe you're writing something like alternative text, which is really long. You can see that it's a long sentence because I'm describing a graphic. Um, for those, I can use this pound sign and then a vertical bracket to define specific uh, chunk options in line inside the chunk. So whether you do this inside the chunk label or inside the actual chunk body, you can define them either way. And so that's very powerful if you want to do like real short things, just keep it in the head. But if you have something like alternative text or a bunch of different options, maybe it's easier to write them inside the body of the chunk. So going back to that graphic we created, you know, this is a fine graphic, but I can't even see all of it. Like it's just printing too big. It's a little bit fuzzy because the DPI is too low. But by changing the parameters and setting figure dimensions to six and four, again, make it a little bit wider than it is tall bump up the quality of the image by changing the DPI. And now I have a much more attractive image. Sure, it's a little bit bare bones in terms of I could change what the actual graphic is, but it's printing how I want it to print. So you can change these different things as needed when you're generating documents. Now, you might also think, well, why don't I just set these globally so that all of my graphics look good? And you can do that. You can have what we call a setup chunk where you define things for the entire document globally. So here we use NIDR, ops chunk, dollar sign set, and then anything we define in here are basically chunk options that are defined for every part of the document. So this one reads as, I don't want to show any of the code. I want all of my figures to have a width of six inches, 
and I want to double the DPI from 72 to about 150 so that they all come out looking a little bit better like they are here as opposed to this you know, smaller image, but it's not as attractive. This is really useful so you don't have to change these chunk options on every single one, but there might be times where you manually change one chunk because you want it to print a little bit differently and that's fine. This is just for globally setting options across every chunk at once. Again, there's many different things you can change and some of them you may never use, some of them you may use all the time. If you wanted to look at what's available, you can run this NIDR ops chunk dollar sign get, and that will return all the different uh, figure options, or you can go to the knitter documentation and look at all the different chunk options you can set. But you can see there's a lot of different things, a lot related to like how big the figure is or what you're doing with caching or evaluating the code, but there's all sorts of different things you can change as needed. I mentioned earlier that chunks can also be named. And again, this is useful for managing your longer documents. Here's a screenshot from my local desktop. Um, I've named the setup chunk. And when I navigate down to the chunk options, I can see not only the header levels, but now I see chunk one named as setup, chunk two named as carbs, chunk three named as pressure, which are referring back to these named chunks here. So that's really, really useful for when you have longer documents, you're trying to navigate between them. You can quickly move back and forth. And also when you render the document, it's useful for troubleshooting. Imagine this one where I have 24 different chunks and it's saying like, oh, there was a failure in chunk 23. And I'm like, oh gosh, I don't even remember what chunk that was. As opposed to if I named it and it was chunk option you know, uh, pressure, I can go back directly to that chunk and fix my code without having to kind of manually find it. So naming it is useful for navigating it initially, as well as you know, fixing problems in the future if you write some invalid code. Also, name chunks can be reused by name. So if I define this chunk as my plot and it's not evaluated, I can initially just print the code like I did here, but then I can reference it down line and say, okay, now I want you to actually evaluate it. And I want you to uh, set it at a different DPI and change the parameters of it. So there's no code in here because it's copying all of the code you defined earlier. And all you're doing is changing chunk options. So I'm just bumping up the DPI and the size of the image. I don't have to redefine the actual uh, body of the text or the body of the code. So this is useful, again, if you have like a plot that you're repeating in different places or you're evaluating with different components, you can reuse that code and be lazier in a good way as you move forward. As far as naming chunks, there are good and bad in terms of these are all the different ways you can name a chunk. You can have it as all lowercase. You can do what we call camel case, which is lower. And then every time it changes a word, you capitalize it. You can do snake or you can do kebab case, which is this, you know, you stab two things together in terms of you have like my kebab or my dash chunk, or you can just add like numbers to the end of it. All of these are more than fine and that's how you can name a chunk. But if you try and do spaces or underscores, these will fail inside of a co chunk name. So you can't do my underscore plot or my space plot. It can't understand that you have to use this format of either all lowercase, this kebab case here, or a uh, camel case or something like that. Now you might run into this in the future, but just you know, stick to this left side of the screen in terms of like how you're naming your chunks if you wanna name them. Now the last part is like, we talked a little bit about globally setting, setting options. There's also this special setup chunk which is where I would typically do all these globally setting. So again, knitter ops chunk set allows you to set different uh, figure options or whatever across the entire document. If you name something setup, there can only be one named setup chunk because that's essentially run first. That's run before anything else and it's evaluated ahead of everything else. So that's a really important chunk. So you can only do that one time and you typically do it at the start of your document. I also have include equals false because this chunk option, typically you don't wanna return the code output. You're just trying to change all the parameters of your document. So it's a special chunk label. You can only have one setup. Typically the first chunk 
Everything else will basically be set from these uh, global chunk options you're setting. I almost always set it as include equal false. So it's evaluated, but nothing is printed. And you can set all your individual chunk options downstream if you wanted to. Now, again, I talked about different language engines. We can actually show what some of those look like in terms of you don't have to only use R. Our Markdown supports Python or Bash or SQL or all sorts of other things. So you can actually write native Python code and evaluate it via reticulate. Um, and so I can write, you know, x equals 42 times 2 and then print this value in Python. I can evaluate essentially like things from the terminal with Bash and actually like put together some documents. Um, I can make a SQL connection and then write native SQL code. So you can do more than just R. So you have a lot of power here to kind of create what you want, edit things, and, and work through it all. And these can all be mixed in the same document. So you might have a document that has R, Python, and SQL. And rather than having to go to three different places, you can write those all in one document as you move forward. Now, for the language engines, again, there's a lot of them. You can look at them with this thing. So you can use NITR NIT engines get, and it will return all the different possible language engines. And there are certain ones that the community has also contributed. So these are just the built in ones. And there's actually many more that are specific to uh, what other people define. So things like a Stan engine uh, was one that was contributed by the community and brought into NITR proper, but you can write other language engines if you wanted to. But some of the common ones, so you have things like you know, Bash or Awk, which are mostly used in like a terminal or a Linux environment. You have SAS, if you have some legacy SAS code you're bringing in, or C++ code, or even Fortran or Julia, like all these other different things you can execute inside our Markdown. All right, so we've been going for about 45 minutes. Uh, we're going to take a short break so that y'all can maybe do a bio break or take a drink of water if you need to. You can also take some time now, if you're good, to explore some of the workshop material. So we've talked a lot about you know, what the anatomy of a chunk looks like. So what I would recommend doing is going to one of these documents inside the workshop. And again, I can copy uh, this project and paste it into the chat for you. So you can go directly to it. Or if you wanted to work locally, um, you can clone this repository or pull code directly from my GitHub. So take a break. We're going to go for five minutes. So we'll come back. Um, it'll be 10.50 for me. And I think that'll be uh, 3.50 for y'all, but five minutes from now. Go and take a break or explore a little bit of this R Markdown document. And you can open up, say, like the uh, stats PDF. So let's do this one right here. Uh, this one, you can maybe look at naming some of the chunk options or just playing around with the code. So knit it. So you can go up here and knit the entire document, or you can run the individual chunk options with the run option. Just play around with some of it with some of what we learned today. So let me start a five minute timer and I will see you back in five minutes. See you in a second. Let me go ahead and mute, mute myself and I'll keep my uh, screen up here for the five minute timer, but I'll see you all in a few minutes.
All right, everybody, we've got about 20 seconds left on the timer. Um, so if you were tabbed over to our studio cloud or you're just relaxing or going to grab a drink or a bio break, um, good time to kind of come back over and we'll get started here in a few more seconds. Um, as you have questions, feel free to put some of them in the chat. Um, I know it's a bit harder to kind of navigate some of these workshops virtually. Um, we're kind of working through that process. Um, but if you have questions or if there's you know tidbits that you'd like to talk about, feel free to just talk through them in the chat and I'll do my best to answer some of them either live or in the, uh, the Zoom chat itself. So we're back into the slides now. Again, if you played around with our markdown, you could have uh, changed some of the header levels or the names or played around with the code and just rendered it, explored it, maybe changed this to capitalize or whatever you wanted to do. Um, a lot of uh, powerful things in, in terms of what you can do with our markdown. So we've talked a lot about the anatomy of our markdown, but now moving back into the slides, we can talk a little bit about using our markdown. Again, going back to our pouring milk example, you don't have to know all the different components about how everything works to start using it. You can just get started using it, and that's great. So, you know, number one, you're going to want to use, like inside our studio, there's a lot of power there to extend your R markdown and make things a lot easier to work with. And typically, you also want to use an R Studio project for your analysis. So this allows you to like store your R markdown, some of your data and your outputs all together in one area, just like you see in our studio cloud. Like if I go in here, I have this workshop project that has everything in it, rather than having to navigate to like my downloads folder and my desktop and my documents, like moving all across, having everything organized in a project makes it easier to work with. It also brings up the idea of, again, the mental model of how R and R markdown work is that what about your analysis is real in terms of what will you save as your lasting record of what happened and where does your analysis live? So in reality, while you can generate a snapshot or an output of what you created with like the PDF document or the presentation or the uh, HTML or whatever, that's just the snapshot. What's real is the code. That's how you actually generated the output and that's what you can reuse or reproduce your analysis. The final document, while it can have code in there, that's just the final document. You need uh, the code to reproduce everything. Inside our studio, you can actually go in there and create a new project. And this basically just creates a new folder with a .r project file and allows you to organize your entire environment there. And then you can share that project across your team. So you could actually give someone that project and they can kind of recreate that environment that you're working with. This is expanded in much greater detail in the r for ds book. So on slide 47, you can go here and click on that link, and that shows you all the different ways that you can do projects and more analysis of it. So we've talked a lot about you know, what anatomy of our Markdown doc looks like, but there's also this idea of like knitting it, which actually creates or combines all the components together to generate some type of output. So you can always go into our studio and use the knit button. Or if you're not inside our studio, or if you want to render it from you know, R itself, you can use R Markdown Render on the file name, and that will render the document out. So if I go into our studio, again, there's the native knit button, which will take whatever document you're hovering and knit it or render that document. Or I can go to the R console and R Markdown it generated my nice uh, tables for me. So R Markdown Render. And then whatever file I want to do. So I can actually navigate to the workshop material and I want to use the GT summary one. So I can render that document. And it will do the same thing. It will, it's exactly the same whether you're knitting or doing it from the R console. It's just different ways of generating it out. Now, something important to note is as we're talking about projects, we're talking about directories is our markdown documents are like within an existing project. So your directory might look like this. You know, it's your username and then your project is called demo project. You have an analysis folder you've created and there's a report inside of it. Then you have a separate folder called data that has a CSV file on it. If I were inside this report and I want to say, what is my working directory? It's going to live with whatever this R Markdown is. It's basically going to say R Markdown is rendering inside its own file directory. 
So if I wanted to navigate to this file, I couldn't just say, go to penguins. I'd have to actually navigate to this file in a different folder. This is where the here package and the here here function is very powerful because this starts from the head. It starts from demo project and then goes to data and penguins.csv. So it goes to demo project data CSV to read it in. So if you were working this report, when you render it, you have to reference something that's in a different folder. I would use the here here package to, to grab that in, to pull it in. Otherwise, if you do like get working directory and you're working inside report, it will give you that folder in terms of this R markdown is living inside the analysis folder. So that's where it thinks it is, because that's where it is. But to reference external ones, you have to reference the external file. There's some longer examples if you want to dive a bit deeper down that path of like splitting out your projects into separate folders and how to use the here package. It's very lightweight package, but very, very helpful. To create a new document in terms of like, I'm showing you examples that are, you know, that have a little bit of code inside them. So you can kind of get motivated about like, what are the things you can do? But you can also just inside our studio, create a new R Markdown document. So you can either do file new R Markdown. You can use command shift P, which is the command palette to open up a new R Markdown document. Or you can also just create a kind of essentially a blank one with the R Studio API. So let's go into our Studio Cloud. And I can do file, new file, R Markdown. And then it'll give me this prompt to be like, what kind of document do you want to create? I can give it a title, the author name. I can say, what is the format I want to create? I can make it a presentation or a shiny document or any of the templates from files I've uh, installed. So like Distill or R Markdown have their own ones. Or just create an empty document if I wanted to go that route. I can also do Command Shift P or I believe it's Control Shift P on, on Windows or Linux. And this will open up basically the uh, command palette, which says like, I want to create a new R Markdown document. And you just basically type in the text of what you want to do, and it will suggest things. So it's like, oh yeah, I want to create a new R Markdown document. And it'll bring you back to this point. But you don't have to navigate up to file, and you can do more than that. You can do like create a new R script or create anything you want, and it will show you all the different options of things you can do. And again, that's Command Shift P to open that up, or you can use the R Studio API, um, create a new document, document new, and then you can just say like text is three dashes because we're doing the YAML header and then we're doing R Markdown, and it will open up this document. And you can kind of go quickly into that. So all those are valid. They essentially do similar things. However, you want to go about it. So demo that real quick. I also showed you earlier how to do insert new chunk. Um, again, you can use the uh, insert chunk option or inside an R markdown, let's do that. You can do command shift I to just insert an R chunk, or you can go to the command palette, insert new code chunk and go that route in terms of like just inserting the chunk itself. The chunk button is up here. So you could always just say like, I don't want to like remember all the shortcuts. I can just do insert a new chunk, insert a new chunk. I want a SQL chunk and do whatever you want with all the different options. As far as the overall anatomy of the R Markdown document living in our studio, that also has a lot of detail around it. So this can look a bit overwhelming in terms of there's a lot of different things up here to think about. Again, you may not use all of them, but some of them are very powerful. So let's break down the different components and talk about it. So left to right for this screenshot, we have the undo redo buttons, basically like control Z to undo what you just did and redo it. You have this button here, which is open in its own new source window, which splits it out from our studio proper. So you can like pull something far to the left and pull something far to the right and work on them at the same time. The save button to save the document. You can automatically make it and check this box where every time you save, it'll actually re-render the document. Our studio also has built-in spell checking and find and replace. So if I'm inside this document, uh, let's do output HTML document. 
So I can undo that and go, or sorry, not undo, but actually go back and forth between documents. I think I said undo, sorry about that. But moving between documents that are in the RStudio panes, you can see it navigating between the documents. Open a new window will basically split it out to its own new window uh, here. So I could like edit it separately and I could pull something far to the right and pull something far to the left and operate on them at the same time. Or I can you know, check the spelling and it says like, hey, I, I couldn't find what LaTeX is. What do you mean by that? And you can either add it to your library or ignore it. Or you can find specific text. Like I find LaTeX and that's like, well, no, let's make it LaTeX or whatever. And I can replace those where I find them and it will ch make the changes to the document. So a lot of power across all those. The knit option is basically take the document and render it out, create the output that I want to see. So here I can knit it to its default of like, I want to knit to HTML or I can knit to the other defaults of PDF or Word. I can also do knitting with parameters, which allows me to change components of the document. So I can define parameters and change them and it will actually change the output of the document. And I can change things like where the directory is knitted or I can just clear all the outputs in terms of like, I had one chunk cached. I want to clear that cache out so that uh, I can clear all the outputs and re-render the document from scratch. If you do knit with parameters here, I'll actually open up a small screen and you can click on the different parameters you want to change as well. The next section of the R Markdown document is a few different things. So if you click on the cog here, it'll open up some of the different options. You can do use the visual editor. Again, flipping back and forth between the visual editor mode where you can see the final document ahead of time. You can change where things are previewed in terms of are they previewed like in the document or in the viewer pane? Do you want to show images and math equations or previews in line? Do you want the chunk outputs in line or in the console and then expand or clear? The one that I want to show live real quick is some things people really like to see in line chunk output. So like if I were to run this patient characteristics, it will print out that in line. Other people might actually go in here and rather making it in line might want to put the output in the console. And this will actually print out things rather than them being in line, they will actually print out in their respective areas. So let's do this. Rather than it printing in the document itself, it's going to pull up them in the viewer or the plot pane. Just a preference thing, but gives you the ability to customize how you want to see it. Again, you have the ability to uh, add specific chunks with the chunk button. You can run the entire document without knitting it. Like say you wanted to run all the lines, but you didn't want to generate the output yet. You can do that with the run button. This blue button here is the publish button, which allows you to publish the document to either our pubs, which is a public website that we run, or to something like RStudio Connect that you run on premise, uh, where you could publish like secure documents behind your firewall that contain like patient information or something like that. That can be done through the publish button. This last one is opening up the uh, outline. So that opens up the header levels and allows you to navigate the document a little bit. This section here, again, we talked about it, but inserting new code chunks, you can do R or you can do all the other different languages. And then we showed uh, knit as well and running either specific lines, which you can do with command enter, or you can run just the current chunk, run everything, or run all of it together, or just the chunks above and below. So you can kind of run things with shortcuts or by using the run buttons themselves. Talked a little bit about publish button, the outline, and this is the visual editor mode. So again, if you're in our studio, you can navigate the outline by clicking on this button, and that will open up this uh, side header. Or you can flip back and forth between the visual markdown, which shows the formatted text, or the raw markdown itself. So the takeaways from this component is document your document. So use your YAML to set up a meaningful metadata. You can style your document by changing things in the YAML header or by changing things in the chunk options. Organize your text and your code with labels. So header labels, knitter chunk labels, you can also stylize your text with markdown, so bold, italics, bullets, lists, all those different things, and use knitter chunk options to change what everything looks like or renders as. 
really the takeaway is knit early, knit often. You want to make sure that your code works and that your output document works. So you might write code that doesn't work, and that's fine. Like you can just quickly change it. But you want to find that out as you go rather than writing a really long document and never having fixed any of the code above it. The last section of today's presentation, as we kind of wrap up in the last uh, 30 minutes or so, we're going to cover graphics and tables. Basically, a lot of the things you're creating with documents or reporting is some type of visual output that you're using to make a decision or report on some things that are happening. So obviously, graphics, the most well-known package in R is ggplot library. There's a lot of documentation with the package, cheat sheet, books, another book three other books about how to do data visualization with ggplot and R, all of which are fantastic and dive very, very deep into making high quality graphics. For today, we're going to be using some mock data, basically medical data that might be more meaningful to you than say like empty cars. And we're going to show you how to create some graphics in R and R Markdown so you can generate them in your reports. So this mock data can be read Again, I'm using the here package to navigate to this folder of data and the mock data.csd file. And then I'm changing it up a little bit so it has this um, follow up data about which patients lived and which patients died in this follow up study. I'm also excluding one location um, because there's some kind of messy data in that. So we're just excluding it. But just showing you like real data, you may have to include or exclude portions because it's just you know, malformed or it's not valid for this data. In our studio cloud, these files are available. So if you go to the project data, you can find this mock data file and work with it. And for the workshop, all of these different examples typically use uh, one of those medical examples of like medical data. So you can go through and look at the mock study analysis, and this will read in that data, and you can then interact with the data a little bit and do conversions around it. Um, this was adapted from some stuff that Peter Higgins did with Allison Hill. And I added a few things about uh, GT tables and making some, some prettier graphics. So if you wanted to follow along or work on this in the future, the mock study analysis R Markdown is a good place to start. So the first one we're going to do is just create, you know, what is the outcome from these patients in terms of what was their survival time for patients that lived versus died? So here we're creating basically a distribution of what the graphic looks like or what the data looks like in terms of we're graphing patients that lived and patients that died as, as well as their survival time for the sensor data analysis. So this is using the GG Ridges R package to create multiple uh, plots. So by the different uh, treatments or the study arms of what they received. Um, and then you can see the distribution separation where all three treatments or locations were basically, there was some impact on patient survival, uh, but there might be some differences between them. Like this is unimodal, this one almost looks like a trimodal distribution. So maybe some differences there that we can explore. For our markdown, we're gonna be controlling what this graphic actually looks like. So while this one looks pretty good, I chose some specific parameters about how to make sure that it came out how I wanted. So in terms of controlling the plot, the things we are important are figure resolution, basically what's the DPI or the quality of the plot. It defaults pretty low, so about 72 DPI or 96 DPI, depending on the format. And that's to keep file sizes small. As you increase the DPI, the quality of the image increases, but it also makes it bigger files. You also control the figure size in terms of physically how big it presents on the screen, uh, in terms of the height and width. You can include figure captions or cross captions, as well as alternative text for people who are reading the document with a screen reader and are visually impaired. For looking a bit more into this, there's a few different resources that are good that go, again, beyond what we're covering today in our quick 90 minutes, uh, but some good examples for you. So for the figure resolution, we have a document here with you know, a DPI of 72. We're using the same plot throughout this section, and we're going to set the figure width at 5. I can also set the DPI to 300 and the figure width to .5. And it's really the same graphic, it's just a little bit higher quality behind the scenes. Because we've set the figure width to be equal, it's not really gonna show up much better on the screen. But when you're actually rendering it out inside like an HTML document, as opposed to this, uh, this presentation, it will look quite a bit different. But the important takeaway is that you can change the DPI with these chunk options 
And you can also change the overall width of the graphic with figure.width. I can also do figure width dot, uh, dash four and it'll make it a little bit more narrow. Or I can do something like change the overall format of it with figure dot retina. For those of you with like MacBooks or have worked with Apple computers, a retina screen is just a very high DPI quality. So figure.retina1 will make it retina quality, which makes it basically the same DPI as a monitor. So pretty high quality. As you change figure.retina to say two or three, it's actually gonna shrink the visual representation because you're making it higher DPI, but smaller width. So it's basically just scaling down the image. So even though both of these are coming out as figure.width 4, figure.retina 3 will make the image higher DPI, but physically smaller. So that can be helpful for like shrinking an image down while maintaining image quality. Figure.retina 2 will be kind of a nice in-between in terms of it's still a good size and you can change it with like the figure width. Or you can use figure.dim, which allows you to set the width and the height at the same time. You can read this as a width of five and a height of three. So again, a little bit wider than it is tall. Alternatively, if I just use something like figure.width equals four, it's going to set the width as four and just use some type of default or you know, best guess at what the height of the image should be. For most things, it'll try and make it into this rectangle where it is uh, wider than it is tall. But by uh, specifying figure.dimension or figure.dim, you can very specifically set the height and the width to be exactly what you want it to be inside of your document. Now, I can also make it uh, where it's like a figure dim of four and six, so make it a little bit taller in this case, or make it a, a lot bigger in terms of changing the dimension to be eight and six. So now the, the document is actually bigger, even though figure.retina is shrinking it down a little bit by bumping up the figure dimensions and making it wider and taller. Uh, as we move forward. So you can play around with all of these and basically find a nice in-between of what you want to use. And by using either DPI, figure.retina, along with figure.width, figure.height, and figure.dim, you can very specifically change the visual representation of the graphic. Even though the graphic itself, like the ggplot code is not changing, how it's presented in your document will change by changing these. You can also arrange plots. So say you were creating multiple plots at once, you could use the patchwork R package to combine different ggplots. So here we're just loading patchwork. We're defining a very basic empty cars data set that's a scatter plot and one with box plots. And then we can just combine them with the same syntax of just a plus sign. So patchwork basically allows you to combine graphics in this way, and it will just try and arrange them in a useful manner. But you can also control the output and the plot layout with Patchwork to do even more powerful things. So let's create one plot. So this is, again, our mock data. And we're doing a distribution of patient ages. So we see a pretty normal distribution, although skewed a little bit over here towards older patients, but pretty unimodal uh, data set. And median is probably around like 60 or so, so old, older patients. But we do have some younger patients in here as well. And then we also have our previously defined survival plot. And we can combine those together with patchwork using just a plus. And it will put them both together, align them on kind of a similar scale, essentially, and throw it all together. I can still change this using figure.dimension and figure.retina to get a nice overall document. But now the R markdown chunk is controlling the combined plots as opposed to individual ones. Because we've created one combined output with patchwork, um, the R markdown chunk is going to affect both of them together, as opposed to just one or just the other. I can also add like an annotation to them. So most of the time when you're you know, creating a document or multiple graphics together, you also want to label them so you can reference like plot A versus plot B. And you can do this with plot annotation and add a tag level of A. And that will add A, B, C, D, however many graphics you've added here it will automatically label them in the top left. Or you can numerically label them by changing plot annotations to one. And there's a several other kind of annotation levels you can do, but just allowing you to put all these documents or in images together and then reference them throughout the document. 
So patchwork, again, very powerful for combining plots. You could always just separate them out into different chunks. But if you wanted to combine plots, patchwork works inside our markdown lovely and allows you to put things together. As far as saving plots out, you know, obviously when you create the document, you embed the graphics in line most of the time. But sometimes you do want to save out the graphics because you do want to use them alone. Like you want to actually have the graphic itself to use somewhere else. Rather than calling GG save, which you might do interactively, you can use figure.path to define a specific location where you want things to come out. There was a neat thread at the end of last year and Sylvia had a great option here of saying like, you know, uh, fig.path is really useful for saving out these images and streamlining the process. When you knit the document, it will save out all of the images in there into that specific library. So you basically define like fig path as like Tom fig path, and it will save all of those documents for me in that specific library, that specific uh, folder. So when I need to go look at them, I have all the images saved there as well as in line in the document. This is a useful one to do inside your global setup chunk. So I like using like a figure dot retina of two, so making them higher DPI, a figure width of six, so they basically take up most of the screen, but not the full screen, and then save them out to this figure dot path of my figures. So whenever I am in my folder, it will save out all the images so I can reference them individually, as well as having them embedded in my overall document. This also gives me no messages or warning. It basically uh, hides all the code unless I explicitly override and say echo equals true for those code chunks. And again, it gives me these high quality figures to my specific directory. You should though experiment in terms of like, you might have different opinions. Obviously you're probably gonna have a different folder than Tom figs. That kind of sounds like I'm eating a lot of fruit and I love figs, but maybe you wanna change it to figures or images or whatever else you wanna do. And you're gonna have your own directory to work in. The next component and something I'm overly passionate about probably is tables. And I think tables are hugely useful. Everyone probably creates tables, but might dread creating tables because they haven't used some of the better packages. So while I can't really go and I could do like 90 minutes alone on tables, that's out of scope for today. But depending upon the output, whether you wanna say like, I want creating something in a Shiny app or a HTML or Markdown or a PDF or Microsoft Word or PowerPoint, you might use different packages. You could always output tables to a PNG, like literally save it like a graphic. And that's fine, like you can embed that anywhere then, but you do lose some of the accessible nature of a table if you save it as a PNG. Some of the packages that I really like for creating tables, um, my favorite is GT Summary and GT. Those are basically uh, a package that's trying to be, as ggplot is a grammar of graphics, GT is trying to be a grammar of tables, basically a high level syntax for creating beautiful tables quickly and easily. GT Summary uses GT and several other packages to allow you to summarize data or even some common statistical outputs very quickly. And I used a lot of GT Summary in the workshop. And if you actually look at some of these, like the GT Summary R Markdown, it creates some very uh, quick and easy tables that are very useful and probably common to uh, medical analysis or patient analysis. So just by doing this table summary on a data set and grouping it by treatment, I get this very useful overall table talking about all the different treatments these cancer patients received, how many patients there were in each of the drug treatment groups, the marker levels, all the stuff really with one line of code. So GT summary is very powerful for creating these useful tables very quickly. Um, Flex table is also really strong if you're primarily outputting to things like Word or PowerPoint. Those have a very hard requirement for putting them in a specific format. Flex tables amazing for creating those type of tables. GT Extras is the own package I developed for embedding a lot of data viz and like columns and bars and spark lines into GT tables. And Cable Extra allows for similar things for like uh, PDF outputs via the cable package. And lastly, the BST function package is written by the same author, Daniel Solberg, for the GT summary. And it's just a miscellaneous collection of packages for doing uh, some biostatistics. 
Again, I'm a huge fan of GT Summary and GT. Uh, GT Summary is especially powerful as it allows you to output to Word, PDF, HTML all at once. And it's a wrapper around several packages with a lot of capabilities built in. So I can load that library of GT Summary along with Tidyverse and the survival package. I can select some data from this trial built-in example. And then again, by doing table summary by treatment, I get this very useful, beautiful table quickly, like one line of code to essentially give me this summary table of all that details. It can also do things like uh, embed uh, inline histograms or density plots or spark lines. And this is actually a wrapper that they provided around my GT Extras package to allow you to embed some of these graphics in line in your summary tables as well. So that's with the BST add sparkline function, which is brought in from GT Extras. It can do more than just these summary tables, but those are really powerful. It can also do things like a regression or a basic linear model or a GLM. So here we're doing a little bit of statistical analysis on top of summarizing it. So it shows you the different uh, chemo treatments for drug A and drug B across these uh, cancer uh, grades, so primarily grade two and three cancers, and then looking at the overall response, the confidence interval, as well as if it was statistically significant with a p-value. So again, with just a little bit of code creating useful tables uh, in R. And while I would love to go as deep as possible in tables, uh, we are limited by time but I have an entire blog post that's very long talking about 10 guidelines for writing better tables in R, which is an adaptation from John Schwabish and his paper on 10 guidelines for better tables. I just adapted it to GT and uh, in the R environment. Now for the last component in terms of meta R markdown, uh, there's the idea of doing things that are more powerful and kind of extending our markdown in useful ways. I do, again, want to give a shout out to um, some of the other content that y'all have created internally in terms of Hansel has created a nice workshop that has parameterized our markdown and some other things. So if you go to uh, his example, you can look at some of the things he's done. And then I have another workshop I put together publicly that's on YouTube that has resources and a very deep dive on like advanced our markdown that goes beyond what we talked about today. But in short, we'll talk about a few of those right now. So our markdown parameters allow you to define some parameters, or in this case, params, inside the YAML header. So I have a title, I have an output, you know, it's creating an HTML document. And then I have these parameters that are defined as params, colon, and then the name of that parameter and its default value. So it's going to be basically state equal to Hawaii. And now I can actually reference those parameters in line in the R markdown document. So I can either use inline text, so you know, do my uh, R params dollar sign data, which will return Hawaii because that's the default value. Or in a code chunk, I can just say, find the parameters and extract the state value, which will again return Hawaii, and I can plot that. More useful example is that when I'm rendering this document, and if I were to say like knit with parameters, I can change what this value is. So basically, rather than limiting it to say, you know, uh, Scotland or England or Wales or wherever, um, I can make it where I can generate multiple reports from the same initial document. So rather than using Hawaii for the US, I could say, I want to generate a report for Scotland. And I can say params, you know, region equals Scotland. And that will generate a report and change all of these values of params dollar sign region to Scotland or to England or to Wales or whatever different region you want to change it to, or a specific hospital or a specific other parameter that you're defining. So more advanced R markdown parameter would be, I still have params, I still have colons, but now I'm doing days. And I'm saying like, what are the number of previous days to look at? It defaults to 90. What is the region to look at? It's going to uh, default to Europe, but you have these other choices that are available. And then when you knit with parameters, it actually pulls up essentially like a little shiny app. But in your local environment, you can say, I want to generate a report with this specific number of days for this region. And it will then knit the document with those values. So again, without you having to change anything else in the document, you can generate a new version of it with parameters. 
As far about parameters and the overall workflow, you can look at the R Markdown book, the R Markdown cookbook, or the advanced R Markdown webinar I gave recently. And those dive very deeply into some of this meta R Markdown workflows and using parameterized reports. The last component is talking a little bit about formats and a little bit deeper. Again, there's dozens of formats you can create, whether they're documents, presentation, journal articles, or other kind of formats. But remember, it's all just code. So learning how to use the anatomy components in terms of the YAML header, the code chunks, and the text, that's going to be consistent across all the different formats. So you can basically learn how to do it once and then create all these different outputs uh, whenever you need to use them. So you can embed those plots, those tables, text, that you know, generate your reports, presentation, websites, books, whatever you essentially need to create or you can think of, you can then create those with our markdown. The default format is always going to be HTML document. This is really like the workhorse of our markdown. It's the default. A lot of power in what you can do with HTML. You can do hyperlinks. You can do you know, interactive graphics where they actually change as you click on them. You can embed Shiny into it, or you could have other different components. And while I love HTML document as the default, um, maybe you want to create something else, like a PDF document, where it's a PDF, and you are more comfortable writing like LaTeX instead of HTML. You can combine, combine uh, you know, R Markdown into a PDF if you wanted to, and go that route as well. A lot of teams I talk to still have a lot of Microsoft Office, and they're collaborating with colleagues who may not know R or may not know Python, and they want to get a Word document or a PowerPoint presentation so they can work with it downstream. You can still pro pro programmatically generate these. So you can use Word document as an output or PowerPoint as an output and programmatically generate ggplot and tables and, and combine them into these documents you're creating that are then handed off downstream for your colleagues to work with. So you can still collaborate with your non-technical colleagues, or if you want to create these documents for yourself, that's also possible. Today's presentation was created with Sharingan, which is a really powerful package for creating interactive presentations with R. Um, again, I've included it in RStudio Cloud, so if you wanted to play around with it, index.rmd uh, allows you to you know, create the exact presentation that I have, including the milk gifts and everything else, so you can look at those and play around with it. The last presentation, or not presentation, but the last format I'm really, really keen on is the distill package. This is my personal favorite format, and it's basically scientific writing, but native to the web. So a lot of different power here in terms of it's, you know, customized HTML, it's very pretty, it's got different ways of like setting up the document, and you can do a lot with it. If I go to the workshop, I included a distilled document for y'all because I think these are very beautiful and I think they're worth, uh, creating and worth exploring. So the example distill, I can go in here and yes, you can look at it, you can change some of the code, but if you render it, it'll give us this really beautiful uh, output very, very quickly, basically a very useful format uh, very, very quickly. So now you have this full document that's got a nice table of contents. It's got some typographic choices. So it's got like a nice font you can do things like add things to the side and the header, and you can change how graphics appear. So they're going to default to showing as like the width of the column. You can also make them a little bit wider or even contain the entire, basically the page. And you can still do all the things that you want to do with like tables or inline code. There's a lot of power here. But importantly, these are just the defaults in terms of like, I only had to change one or two components. So for the distill format, I just set my author name as Thomas Mock and a specific URL to my blog. And I said, yes, I want a table of contents. It's going to respect up to header level three and have it float to the left. You get all of that formatting and stylization for free, essentially, with it. And you can change some of it, but just the defaults are very attractive. And then lastly, let's say you wanted to write an entire book, either for internal knowledge sharing or for like a, a public book. You can write entire books in R Markdown, and the R Markdown books themselves were written in R Markdown, which is kind of meta in, in a good way. And then lastly, just kind of leaving you off here, there's a lot of different resources to go in specific directions. Obviously, like the world of R and R Markdown is, is huge in a great way. 
and you can go down paths to learn just the parts you want to learn about. So a lot of different good resources here from our studio and externally. And then there's a nice one that's our markdown for scientists by Nicholas Tierney that I'm a big fan of because it's more applied to scientific and statistical analysis. Basically like I want to do some math or customize some figures or captions and citations, things that are specific to like scientific principles as opposed to general scientific computing. So you can actually include external references or dot bibliography files, and you can look at those and work with them. And it talks about different formats and workflows, a great resource in addition to all these other resources that are available. So we're right at the 90 minute mark um, and I'm happy to walk through any questions or we can go through a few of the different uh, workshop materials together. A um, lot of different resources I put into the workshop, both in the RStudio cloud, where you can kind of just get started and running with them as you see fit. You can either open up the documents, change them up a little bit, or just render them as is or change different components. And I've tried to include different formats. So you have Word, PDF, HTML, you have my Sharingan presentation, you have distill, and then you have one that's more of like a real basic analysis you might do with some statistics some tables, some graphics, the whole kit and caboodle there. Um, good question from the chat. I'll read that out loud. Uh, if you have any package recommendations to be used to create interactive plots, e.g. to create a data dashboard in our markdown. I'm not sure if ggplot can be used to make interactive plots. So two packages that I'm a big fan of, um, number one is going to be Plotly R and GGI RAF, which is kind of a play on words for uh, uh, giraffe. So let's do those two real quick. Let's do Plotly R book. Yeah. So the Plotly R book, this one talks about uh, creating interactive graphics with R. The really powerful uh, resource here is that, you know, to your point about ggplot and ggplotly, let's install uh, plotly real quick. Plotly includes the ability to take a ggplot and essentially turn it into an interactive component. So while that's installing, we can actually go here and I think it's ggplotly. Uh, so ggplotly basically says, take a plot, a ggplot you've created with plot, uh, sorry, take a ggplot plot that you've created and then turn it into interactive. You basically just wrap it in ggplotly and it will translate the, the ggplot code into plotly code. That um, works 90% of the time in terms of you can just write a plot in ggplot and then just call ggplotly around it. But you can also natively write uh, Plotly code in R with the Plotly package. GGIRAF takes a similar approach, but it doesn't use Plotly behind the scenes. It makes it um, interactive with SVG. So in a similar way, let me zoom in a little bit here for you. You create a ggplot. You say, you know, I want to have some tool tips, for example. And then you use geompoint interactive as opposed to geompoint. And that, along with GGI RAF, actually allows you to get you know, interactive components. So I can just load this code chunk that's used from the links that um, Hansel put in the chat. Thank you very much for doing that. And either Plotly uh, R or the GGI RAF packages are great for that. Companions to that, and a follow-up question might be uh, DTR package. So the DT or reactable R packages are good options for interactive tables in R. So again, this is a table, but it's written in R. And in one line of code, data table iris, you get a sortable and searchable table in R. So this allows you to take like very large tables that are maybe too big for static, and then you can sort by different columns and interact with them. Reactable in the reactable R package is another good package for doing these. And it's got some absolutely beautiful uh, tables you can create in terms of like a recreation of like Spotify, but in R. Like pr pretty interesting stuff you can do with like really beautiful graphics and you know embedding things like 
you know, colors and all sorts of other amazing things you can do with, uh, with Reactable as well. What other questions do y'all have? Flex table is also really good. That's one that's uh, great for making tables in uh, Office as well as interacting uh, with HTML and other formats, uh, a really powerful table. Any other questions from the group in terms of R Markdown or extension packages or anything else? And feel free to unmute if you want to have questions. I think we're at time. My understanding was we were here for 90 minutes, but yeah, Jay, feel free to drop off and thanks everyone for your time. Um, I'll hang out for a little bit longer uh, if we can, or if y'all need to hop off to something else, um, I can let y'all go. Again, some of the resources in case you want to find those. Um, for the resources publicly, again, the slides or all of the workshop materials are going to be on my GitHub at uh, rmd-nhs. Um, and I just dropped those in the chat again. I'll stop screen sharing. And, and again, I'll hang around for a little bit. Maybe Hansel or Charlotte, there's some questions. There's so many different packages, more being developed and released. How do you stay on top of all of it? Great question. I think in general, um, that things like LinkedIn, and this is something Hansel and I were talking about before, like LinkedIn and Twitter and the RStats hashtags are really great for just kind of getting slow drips of information um, kind of periodically. I'll share my screen one more time and we'll actually go to, uh, oh, we'll go to uh, our weekly. I really like this as a collection of blogs. Um, and our weekly is basically a community resource that aggregates a lot of different things that were updated. So if you didn't want to kind of listen to the constant stream of LinkedIn or the constant stream of Twitter, this is a nice like weekly snapshot of what things happened this week. And it, they do some information about like highlights and like cool things that happened are in the real world and talking about different blog posts people have written and lots of great stuff on there. Um, the other resources that are great was uh, the Tidyverse blog. So if you are a big fan of the Tidyverse, they stay up to date there with like the Tidyverse blog or the RStudio blog is one that I obviously listen a lot to because there's lots of different updates here in terms of different packages and you know different updates like some of the stuff we did at R and Pharma uh, the past week or two. Um, cool. All right. Uh, again, thanks for everyone's time. I, I hope this was useful and tried to kind of balance that uh, ground between things that are useful for people just getting started with our markdown, as well as some more of the details that, you know, even if you've been using our markdown for a long time, might be new to you. Like there's always a format or a setting that you can change that you may have never used before. And I personally learned quite a bit going through all of it with y'all. So have fun with it. Good luck. And thank you for all the amazing work y'all do. Um, have a great weekend. Be safe. And we'll see you next time. So over to you, Hansel. Okay. Thank you so much, Tom. That was awesome. Um, yeah, definitely a lot of information to take in. I'll stop recording now. Cool. Uh, let's see.